We're now going to walk through the implementation of the async task barrier framework, which has been used throughout our case studies up to this point in order to allow many tasks to run either synchronously or asynchronously, and then wait for the completion in the calling thread. In particular, this video will show how various operators in Project Director's Flux and Mono classes can be used to implement this quite interesting framework. The async task barrier API contains methods that register, unregister, and run tasks, which can either run synchronously, in other words, blocking, or asynchronously, do computations in the background. It provides two methods that register and unregister tasks. These methods are passed suppliers, and this allows us to be able to pass method references to the register and unregister methods, making it very clean and easy to integrate various test functions or test methods that we want to examine. The tasks that are passed to register and unregister are stored in an internal list, which is a list of suppliers to monos to voids. The most important method, however, is arguably the run tasks method, and it provides a method that runs all the tasks that have been registered, either synchronously or asynchronously, again, depending how they're implemented and how get returns and invokes the computation that's passed in as a parameter to register. This method returns a mono to long, and that means that it won't block. It'll simply let the operations continue and then eventually emit a value. So you can use it in a wholly asynchronous and reactive way. Or you can take the result that comes back from run tasks, and you can call the block method or one of the block operators that are defined on mono, because there's a couple of them, in order to block the calling thread so it won't exit until all the asynchronous task processing is finished. And this turns out to be quite useful for our various test programs. So if you want to find the implementation of this asynchronous task barrier framework, take a look at the link at the bottom of the slide. And now, of course, we're going to walk through the code itself. We're now in my IntelliJ project for Flux Case Study EX4, where we're going to take a look at the async task barrier class. This class is actually the same in all the different case studies. We're just picking this one because it's the one that we have covered most recently. This class can be used to run synchronous or asynchronous tasks using various project reactor features we're going to walk through below. It can also be used to ensure that the calling method, the run tasks method, doesn't exit until all synchronous or asynchronous tasks finish their processing. The documentation for the class has a little sample usage where some asynchronous tasks are registered and then we call the run task method and so on. We'll walk through this code a little later towards the end of the video when we look at the unit tests in detail. But first, let's take a look at the field that's defined in async task barrier called S tasks, which is a private static final field that will define a list of suppliers to monos to void. And this, of course, is implemented as an array list. We use supplier here so we can pass in method references to the register and unregister methods we're about to walk through. Speaking of which, here's the register method, which will, of course, register its task parameter so it can be run synchronously or asynchronously when run tasks is called. You'll note that each task parameter takes no parameters and returns a mono to avoid when its supplier get method is called by run tasks. All that register does, it just adds the tasks to the end of the list. Let's take a look at the corresponding unregister method. It also takes a task. And of course, the idea here is to unregister this task, assuming it's been previously registered by a call to register. All we do is we go in and try to do the call to remove on this task, try to take it out of the list. And if it succeeds, it returns true. Otherwise, it returns false. You'll notice when we talk about the unit tests a little later in this video, that there's some subtleties about the method references you pass to register and unregister to make sure that they have the right values. But that'll come up here shortly. The real interesting method here, of course, is run tasks, which is used to run all the tasks that are registered via register. And this method will use on error continue internally. And that operator, which we'll look at in just a second, is subtle because it means that any of the tasks that are registered with the async task barrier must use the on error stop operator in conjunction with the on error resume operator if they want to do that type of exception handling in order to avoid subtleties or problems with the on error continue operators overriding of the behavior of on error resume. If you want to learn more about the subtleties involved here, take a look at this link, which goes into some detail about 
what's going on and how you can work around that by using on error stop. The run task method returns a mono to a long that will be triggered or that will omit when all the synchronous or asynchronous tasks that have been registered complete. And it will indicate how many of these tasks were run successfully. In other words, they were able to complete without having an exception thrown that was not caught. Let's go take a look at run task. It's got some very interesting code, primarily to handle exceptions in, in subtle ways. So we start out by making ourselves a local variable called exception count that keeps track of how many exceptions have occurred. And we make this an atomic long. You'll see why we need to use that later. And we set its value to zero. We then go ahead and define an error handler that will log an exception that's thrown and then increment the exception count by one. You can see all it does is it goes ahead and prints out the name of the exception and the information about the exception that's returned by the exceptions get message method, and then it increments the exception count by one. Let's go see what happens here in the main flux stream in run tasks. We start by taking the S tasks list and then converting that into a flux. And we use the from iterable factory method operator. And that will then create a flux of suppliers that have monos to void as their uh, return parameters. We then use the flat map transforming operator to pass in the supplier get method, which will be called on each of those tasks. And that will go ahead and run whatever was registered, which is typically, again, a supplier reference, or sorry, a method reference. And what we end up doing is by calling get, that will either run synchronously or asynchronously, and it will return a mono to a void. And so what comes back from flat map is a flux to void, which is kind of an unusual data type. We then use the on error continue operator to catch any exceptions that may occur that are unhandled by the get methods and then log those exceptions and continue the processing. We don't want to prevent other tasks that are running from being shut down just because one of them throws an unhandled exception. Now, the subtle point here is that the use of on error continue has implications for tasks registered with the async task barrier. In particular, they have to use the on error stop operator in conjunction with the on error resume operator if they want to be able to handle the exceptions using on error resume. And this is described in the earlier illustrations of this in case study uh, EX3, as well as our discussions about different error handling operators that are part of Flux. We then take the results of this, which may be nothing, I mean, in other words, may not on error continue may not be called at all if there's no exceptions that aren't caught by the get methods that are invoked. And we call the collect list operator. This is a combining operator that will collect into an empty list because everything's returning monos to voids. And collect list will trigger when all the tasks finish running either synchronously or asynchronously. And you can see in this case that we get back a mono to a list of void. And a list of void is kind of an unusual type because it doesn't actually return anything. It's essentially a no op or a null. And therefore, we can't just take the size of the list to know how many things finished. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use the flat map operator on mono, and we'll take the number of elements in the original list of tasks, you pass that as a parameter to just, and make sure we subtract off the number of exceptions that were thrown. So you can see here that tasks, s tasks dot size minus exception count got get will return the number of tasks that finish correctly without having an exception thrown that was not handled by the get method that launched them. So this is some subtle code. It took a little while for me to figure out how to get it all working correctly. And it still has that side effect that you have to be aware of where on error resume operators have to be used in conjunction with on error stop in the actual method references that we're testing. But I think this is the cleanest way I could do it with the features that are part of Project Reactor. Now that we've walked through the source code for the async task barrier framework, it's time to turn our attention to the async task barrier unit tests. We'll start by taking a look at the various methods that will be used to demonstrate the features of async task barrier. The throw exception method intentionally triggers an arithmetic exception. You can see we take a numerator, divide it by zero, and that will be guaranteed to throw an exception. And that particular exception is going to propagate up and be caught by the async task barrier in its on, continue, on error continue operator. 
Let's now take a look at a couple of different test methods that demonstrate the features of on error resume. The first one shows how on error resume works when on error stop is not combined with it. In this case, we're also going to create a numerator divided by zero using the map transforming operator. And we think we're going to catch that exception and print it out and return an empty flux. However, there's no call to on error stop after on error resume. And because there's an on error continue call downstream from where the get method is called. The get method, of course, is what's invoking the method under test here, the on error resume one method. Then that means that on error continue is going to handle this, not on error resume, which is quite confusing if you're not aware of the semantics. To demonstrate how to get the perhaps desired semantics, we have another test method called on error resume two. You can see here, we once again divide by zero. We call on error resume except this time we call on error stop after that. And that will end up actually handling the exception, printing out the exception that was thrown and then returning an empty flux. So very subtle ways of being able to deal with the differences between on error resume and on error continue. Let's show some other methods. These two methods will complete successfully. They don't throw exceptions. They're designed not to. Synchronicity completes successfully, just multiplies 10 by 10 just to do something synchronously. And then asynchronously completes successfully, we'll multiply 10 by 10, but it's going to do it in the thread that's provided by the single factor method in the scheduler's utility class. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the actual unit test itself. This is the at test annotated method called test exceptions. And you can see the first thing it does is it makes a bunch of local variables and it assigns certain method references to those local variables. We do this so that the unregister method in async test barrier will work as expected. We then go ahead and register all these local variables that all contain the method references. And then just for kicks, we go ahead and register one that's not registered through a, a local variable, but instead is just the method reference itself. What happens is every time you use a method reference, it creates a, spe a specific object that will be a supplier, and those will all be unique unless we stash them away in local variables or fields and then use them when we call on register later. Here's the first call to async task barrier run tasks that goes ahead and runs all those test methods, either synchronously or asynchronously, blocks the calling thread waiting for the results. And what'll happen here is we'll end up with two calls that will actually be handled by async task barriers on error continue handler. So those won't be considered to have completed successfully, but three will complete successfully, which is what we expect. Then we go ahead and unregister all but one of the methods being tested using the local variables to do this because that'll always have the same value that we register them with. Then we rerun async task barrier. This time it's only going to run the asynchronously completes successfully test or method. And so we should end up with a test count of one. So if we run the tests and we take a look at the results, this is what we get. You can see here that we get two calls to divide by zero, which is actually handled by the async task barrier framework, just as a logging mechanism. Then the on error resume to call is actually captured by that on error to method and it's on error resume method because we used on error stop in that case. So once again, everything works as expected. We complete three tests successfully at the beginning and one test successfully with the second call to run tasks on async task barrier. So hopefully this has helped you understand better how the task barrier actually works. And also hopefully you understand the subtleties between on error continue, on error resume, and on error stop a little bit more intimately.